All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour. Let's get going, y'all. So welcome. Welcome to What's New for 2211. My name is Donna Bachowski, and I'm one of the educators here at Bywater Solutions. Um, there will be a tag team of us working through the process. So just quick uh, heads up of who's here. Um, we have Heba. Heba, you all know, has been with us for a couple of years and is working on education and all sorts of great things. She is now focusing on training and documentation. So she's responsible for our Koha question of the week, among other things. So you'll see a lot of that documentation. She's the one that's kind of corralling us all um, to get that stuff done and posted. Also have with me, um, and I'm just going in the order that everyone's on my screen, Lisette. Um, many of y'all may be familiar with Lisette. Um, we snagged her a couple months ago, and she is now part of our education team helping with support and ongoing education and all those sorts of things. We're very happy to have her here. Uh, our newest face is Esther, and Esther has been with us for two weeks now. We also snagged her, um, and she is working with us um, doing education. As you all know, Esther is a cataloging guru, um, so she is our our our, uh, our life belt, um, helping us to stay afloat with how education is working with um, uh, cataloging all of those things, but she will be expanding into other things too. Um, but that's where we're, we're really kind of picking all those bits of things out of her brain right now. And she is creating amazing documentation. So if you do have cataloging questions, we'll have some amazing documentation that you can use with all of that sort of stuff also. And then last but not least, we have Katrina. Um, and Katrina has been with us about a year now um, and is uh, education and doing all sorts of exciting things too. So um, these are the familiar faces that you're going to see for right now. Um, so welcome. We're glad that you're here. Here. Um, we are going to go just kind of fly through this What's New uh, 2211 webinar. Um, the recording will be up probably tomorrow on the Hub, um, where we have uh, Monday's recording also. Um, everyone is muted, but the chat is enabled, so you can go ahead and put any of your questions into chat. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and turn this on over to, I guess, Heba or Lisette, who gets started first. Get first. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And we're going to get started here. Um, so the big thing that's coming. Oh, it's still loading. There we go. This is what you, similar to what you might currently see when you log into Koha main page. But there was a huge overhaul in the interface design. So we've got a nice new interface here you've still got all the you know check out check in renew search patrons it's just streamlined a little bit and you can also set you know search by library and select your options over here for your search so that's a really nice new overhaul that's throughout the whole system there's lots of nice updates um we also are displaying the Koha version down here on the homepage now, which is just nice. If something's going weird, you can see what version you're on right away without having to load the About Koha screen. Um, on a lot of, and Heva's going to go into this more later, we've got this configure button, but on some of the tables, we also now have the ability where if you make some of these changes on the table, it should now save those changes even when you update the page. Currently it's only working for the branches, but there are bugs to add it to all the rest of the tables that are gonna have this configure button. So that addition should be coming soon, hopefully. They're working on it. But for now branches, it'll save that and it saves those it's supposed to save as a cookie so that it'll save as long as you have that cookie for branches for now. Uh, we also have our new e-resource management module, which Kelly and Jesse have done a bunch of great blog posts on how to set it up and how to use it. But this is great for keeping, you know, your like overdrive contracts and agreements and licenses, things like that, somewhere that's nice and accessible. Um, there's also an e holdings options as well. And then now, like the CERC control and the reserves control, there's a new system preference, CERC control returns branch, where um, it will use, you can set which library's rules it's going to check. Right now, it just checks the owning library. 
um, but now you can have it check the item where it's checked in or the holding library or the keep it at the item own like uh, the owning library of the item. And now I'm going to hand it over to Heba for the next few agenda items. One of the new things that all of us on the education team are very excited about. Um, and that is the ability to configure a table from where you are in the site. So um, it used to be if you wanted to change like, oh, I don't really need to see the renewals column um, and my, um, I don't know, date last borrowed. I don't really want to see that either right off the bat. You used to have to go into administration, go to the tables and then go, okay, was that a catalog? Was that, a, was that holdings? Was that other holdings? What was the name of that table that I'm trying to fix? Um, there's a lot of the guesswork taken out because it takes you right into the um, table, table settings um, module and let's get rid of these things too. Yeah, we don't wanna see data last borrowed. We'll go ahead and save that go back to our setting and refresh my page and now they're gone so the the gear is just for changing your session you don't want to see it right now but it doesn't do anything to any anybody else's view configure is for the folks who have the administrative privileges um all together or at the very least the manage column config permissions, which does not roll off the tongue, by the way. Um, so if you have permissions and you see a gear, any table that can be configured around Koha, you will have the gear and the ability to jump right in and fix it on the fly right there. Um, and that is to change it for your entire library. My, um, my other two uh, new, new features here are they're less, uh, visibly demonstrable. So I will just tell you about them. Um, one is a change to the renewals table. So it, <clears throat> previously, if you wanted to get renewal information and a report, you would pull in from the issues table or the old issues table if you were looking at historic information. Um, now their renewals have broken out into their new table, which is the checkout renewals table which gives a little bit more information. Who renewed a thing? How did they how did they renew it? What interface was that on? Um, and that all ties back to the issue ID. So you could chase it back to its initial checkout if you wanted more information that way. Um, the, the one thing to know is that in, in addition to that new table being created and that new information being tracked, you it does change a couple fields on issues and old issues. So if you have a report that looked at um, a renewals count, um, it used to be renewals was the name of that column in that, in that table. Now it is renewals count. So you may have a few reports in your library that you're gonna get a message when you run it after 2211 that says, hey, some of this information doesn't exist. What do you want? What are you trying to get? What are you trying to look at? Um, that is changing issues.renewals to issues.renewals count. Um, and if you are, if you've got a reports guru in the house, that's an easy change. If not, send in a ticket, we'll help you out with that. Heba, a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. Just says uh, renewals still show in the statistics table, correct? Yes. Yes, this is, this is pertinent to tracking more of the details um, broken out into their own table, basically. So a little bit more information on renewals. I know we have some of our data hungry libraries really wanted more information there. So um, that, um, that's where that development came from. And we have another question in the chat, Heba. And, and this actually goes back to what Lisette was sharing about the table configurations. Mm -hmm. The question is about on the fly customization. Would that impact all libraries with items attached to a bib record? So it depends uh, on which which button you are using to configure. Yes. So if um, 
If you are using the wheel configuration, uh, that is just for your view, the, the logged in user view. If you have permissions and you are configuring with the wrench, um, those are going to apply across your system. Yeah. The wrench is, we really don't store that data in any of our item information. Let's not do that or um, you're hiding something on another field. I just pulled up the bib record because that is the most common table that libraries are going to want to futz with because you're going to look at that every day when you're doing your, your circulation duties. Um, and then the other, other change to the data um, is that patron category code is now being logged at statistics. So issues, uh, checkouts, renewals, and local use will now log the category code of the patron who performed that or who that transaction is tied to. So you could get that information before, sort of, somewhat, if you connected the borrower number to the borrower's table, and then you realized that you needed to also connect to the deleted borrower's table. Um, but that didn't necessarily tell you the category they were at the time they checked it out. So this grabs category code at time of, of, of transaction. Um, simplifies reporting and gives you a little bit more accurate view of who's checking out what. Just a quick follow up. Um, we mm -hmm. had another question and I'm going to just share my screen real quick. Yeah. Um, show everyone. Um, so we had a question of does the table config settings also customize the public OPAC view of the record? Um, so in the administration table settings, these are all of the tables that are controlled um, in there. And there is a section in there for OPAC where you can decide um, for biblio table, um, course reserves and holdings and subscriptions, what information is in there. So if you are using the Koha OPAC, you do have that same ability to come in here and customize what displays using the table settings. Yep. Um, and that that that's it for me. So I'm bouncing it back to Lizette for um, the OPAC and public services features. Thanks, Hebba. So there's a few new options for patrons to be able to cancel holds that are already waiting and also change pickup locations as well, items are in transit. And so there's a new section in the circuit fine rules here, default waiting hold cancellation policy, where you can set by patron category, item type, and just a simple yes or no, is cancellation allowed? And then what that looks like on the OPAC is this item is waiting, and I've set that yes, they can cancel the hold. Um, and so now it requests canceling the hold. It stops showing for them. And then on the circulation holds waiting pickup, there's a new tab that there's a hold with a cancellation request. And you can cancel the hold from here directly. Um, so that's new. One thing to keep in mind is that if you are using Aspen, this does not currently work properly. There is a bug 33573 um, to fix the problem with Aspen that has been signed off, but it's not yet in Koha. So if you are using Aspen, just be aware that this does not function yet. But anyone using the Koha OPAC can, does have the option to turn that on if they want. And then the other part is allowing, how oh, interesting is my, I lost one of my links. There's a new system preference for changing pickup location. And that one is an OPAC change pickup location. I believe it's, OPAC allow user to change branch. And so then you can select in transit pending suspended or none or a combination therein. And again, that will look, we've got these holds here. Um, we have it set that both suspended holds can change the branch. 
and also waiting and transit holds can change the branch and that just opens up a nice new pickup location you can save it if you change the one that's in transit then when it gets checked in at the at the whatever branch it was in transit to then it'll just go to the new branch when it's ready and just as a general reminder to everyone the a lot of these features that we're demonstrating are not enabled by default so don't start panicking panicking right now of your patrons are going to be able to start you know canceling holes and all of that sort of stuff that are waiting these are all things that you will need to go into your system preferences and configure or turn on before your patrons can use those so just remember those okay um and then it says looks like patrons can't cancel in transit holds correct there's not the, the wait-in does not do in-transit. So you can change the branch of an in-transit hold, but you cannot currently cancel in-transit. Right. So we would need to wait until the item was actually at the destination library, and then the patron would be able to cancel it once it has been checked in at that location. Yep. Excellent. And um, just as a, a thank you, um, Montgomery County Public Library sponsored the um, abilities to make these changes to waiting in transit and uh, canceling holds. Okay, next is add the ability to create save searches. So oh, there's these search filters now that you can make within um, the staff side, which then also will show up on the OPAC, where you know you can say, "Oh, I searched for Percy Jackson. It came with 29 results, but I really only need to see the Lightning Thief, and I don't want to go back and into the advanced search, change my settings." Now it'll just show those five results instead, so you can search within the results, but then you can also save that search as a filter. You can name it, or if you're updating an existing filter, that's also an option. And you can change the visibility to show in the OPEC or in the staff interface or both. And so that looks like this in the staff interface. It's got these custom search filters over here on the search. And you can say, I want audiobooks. There are no audiobooks. Um, or if you save the save this one, it'll show on both parts now. And do that same limitation here. And the ability to create safe searches as filters, that one was sponsored by Round Rock Public Library, one of our partners. So thank you to them for sponsoring that. And then the last item I have is when you do a search in the OPAC and then click in to one of the items, there's the browse results feature over here. Oh, interesting. That's not the results it should be browsing probably because it wasn't my most recent search. So let's fix that. I haven't seen that before. So before it wasn't showing um, the volume information in here. So it would just have shown the Flowerpedia and you'd have, you know, four Flowerpedia results and didn't know which one was which, but now it's got a little more information for you um in this browse results which is just helpful for being able to navigate that better and next we have back to <laughs> for patrons in circulation how about where is that or sorry have a not have a, yeah pause have a, yeah <laughs> set as a question where so is that does, additional information coming from Lisette? Those are coming from the uh, part name and part number fields. It, so whatever's linked to that in the Koha to mark mapping. 
Again, not a cataloger. I'm thinking like 245H. 245N and P, it looks like. Okay. Medium uh, subtitle, medium, part number, and part name do not display, but that's how it's differentiating between the records. Excellent. All right, now you can talk, Emma. It's coming to patrons and circulation um, tools. So guarantees, guarantors. Um, used to be any category that you wanted to be able to be a guarantee, you had to say they were a child. And this kind of sort of worked for public libraries where that's most of their, most of their guarantees are, are minors. Um, definitely got a little weird for the law libraries where they maybe wanted a law firm to be the guarantor and the lawyers associated with that firm to be a guarantee. And it didn't even fully work for public libraries either because sometimes you have guardianship situations where somebody needs to be responsible for another person's library materials, but they're not a child. Um, so now the ability to make a patron a guarantee is, um, has moved into a toggleable option in your patron categories. So rather than, okay, they need to be a child to be a guarantee, that can they be a guarantee setting is independent of the category type. Um, if, this, if this means you are gonna be making some changes to your patron categories on this knowledge in 2211 and you want some help to make sure everything is set there, please go ahead and put in a ticket and we'll help you out with that. Um, I see a couple things in the chat. Or, okay, those are just links. So yes. Um, Patron categories can be set category by category. Can they be a guarantee? I think this is gonna make a lot of libraries happy and solve some really weird workarounds that may have developed as, as a need for that. Um, our next um, feature is um, really, so we've got some new features on some patron account information. So I'm gonna look up our friend Zafad Bibelbrox. Um, first feature is the ability to print their account balances. Um, so that notice is for any account that has outstanding balances. Now that's usually going to be fines owed. If there is an account with credits owed out to the patron, they will also have that print account um, information button pop up. And the notice that goes with that is in your um, notices now, and that is accounts underscore summary. So if you're looking at this and you're like, oh, that's not very pretty. We would like to customize that a little bit more. Um, it is a template toolkit notice. Those are a little bit more involved to fix. Um, put in a ticket if you want to change anything there. Um, but it is meant to give you a quick at a glance, hey, this is, this is account information. You owe us some money or we owe you some money. Print it out at the desk and go. Um, a couple other new things that you may notice um, on Zafod's account here. We've got a pronoun field. And this one, you may not be able to tell what's going on just at a glance. So I'm going to pop in to edit the patron and see. Take a look at this. We have a middle name field in Koha now. This is another thing that libraries have had to get a little creative with before, whether that is appropriating the other names field or whether that is doing first name space middle name to differentiate all your Johnsons and Smiths and common last names. Um, so that is a, a new field that is entering the borrowers table. If you are, if you have been doing some work around shenanigans to fit middle names in, um, and you want to get those moved into the middle name field, um, please put in a ticket. Our data team knows that this is something that the libraries may be, may be wanting to make some changes on. Um, all of these fields, middle names, um, pronouns, those are present in all the pertinent system preferences about what, what do you wanna show? What do you wanna hide? What can people modify themselves? Um, what shows up when you edit an account? Um, they all live in their relevant system preferences. The one that I did want to um, call out specifically is the default patron search 
fields system preference. Um, if you wanted to bring middle name into that and you have other information that you have added to your default search fields, you will need to add middle name. If you have nothing in there, middle name is by default going to be searched from now on, but that is something that you may need to revisit and check on. And um, the pronouns field right now is just a free text field. Um, there is a bug in community that is trying to find a balance between pre-selected authorized value type thing and the ability to make it a free text field since it is probably not possible for libraries to encompass every single pronoun and neo pronoun that their community members may may um, be using. So right now it's free text. Um, there is a bug in the community to bring more different functionality to that. And just confirming the pronoun field can be hidden, correct? Yes, if if that is not something useful that can be hidden in borrower unwanted. Um, and then another um, circulation thing, circulation change is under your circulation rules, we have some new options for your default lost item refund on return policies. Um, this one is going to make a lot of libraries very happy. There are two changes here. The first change, um, Previously, your refund lost item charge options were either leave the lost item charge on there, refund the lost item charge. Um, those were kind of the only two toggles on that front. Now you can refund lost item charge only if unpaid. So for the libraries that you have to go through a business office to issue a refund for a lost item, or a bursar's office, or a registrar's office, or city uh, finance department. Previously, you would get these floating credits in Koha that you had to deal with when you were going to be doing other things to issue that refund. So now you have the ability to refund that lost item charge only on the ones that are unpaid, um, in addition to the options you already had. The other pain point that this is, that is um, being going to make a lot of partners happy is the ability to do stuff with the lost item processing charge. So um, moment of pause here because I know we had we have had so many tickets over the years asking about this. Previously there wasn't the lost item charge it once it was on the account you had to deal with it in some way whether it was paying it or waiving it. Now you can set a default rule um, to leave it, that is the current existing behavior, refund it because, you know, they've already paid for the lost item at this point. Like, let's, let's just uh, wipe that or refund it only if they haven't paid it yet. So you have a little bit more options for how you want to handle processing fee. Um, our early adopters found that, that they were suddenly generating refunds where they hadn't been before. That has been fixed. So as of the upgrades that are happening later this month, um, that it will come in retaining the existing behavior of leaving the lost item charge. And then if you want to change it to the new refund behavior, you have the ability to do that. Um, any questions about that? Or is everyone just like imagining how much less time they have to spend fighting with um, waiving things that they don't have to anymore? I think everybody's just happy. I think right. that's going to that's gonna make a lot of partners happy that we've got that feature included in this release. All right. And that that's my section. Awesome. So Katrina, I think you're up next. Yeah, I get to share my screen. Um, I'm so excited because um, <laughs> Monday I saw Heather Hernandez was on. So um, our favorite, one of our favorite partner catalogers. So catalogers in the room, this one's for you. Clutch your proverbial pearls. We have a new cataloging module homepage. 
so exciting where this used to be just like a blank screen with our three edit buttons up here at the top. We now have all of the tools that we used to have to go back and forth between the cataloging module and the tool screen. Now all of our cataloging tools are in the cataloging module. Uh, so this is super exciting, just makes workflows a lot easier, fewer clicks for the catalogers. In addition to the tools that we had in the tools module and 22, uh, 2205, we also have fast cataloging added from our circulation module. We've got a new link there. And if you have permissions, uh, you will also see a link. The preferences will take you right into the cataloging preferences in administration and configuration will take you right into Koha administration quick link instead of having to do more and then drop down. So uh, in addition to what we already had, we moved everything into the cataloging module and just made it a lot more navigable and uh, easy for catalogers to get to the tools that they need. Let's see. Let's see what else. Um, the next thing is a system preference. Um, so I'm actually gonna follow that link. And we used to have a system preference called uh, Biblio Ads Authorities. And um, found that that was a little confusing because it actually did two things. Um, and so keeping those clear has been simplified in this release. So that Biblio Ads Authorities uh, system preference has been removed. And in its place, we now have two new system preferences. One is require choosing existing authority and auto link bi biblios. So we have two new system preferences. And um, the first one, this require choosing existing authority is going to indicate whether a cataloger has to reference existing authorities. So if I have this set to require, I'm going to have to choose existing authorities as I am creating and editing records. And auto link Biblios is gonna determine whether Koha is gonna try to link to existing authorities upon saving. Um, and then it still will call on the um, auto create authorities system preference, which it was doing before to determine whether unmatched headings will be either linked to a new authority or remain unlinked. So for those um, who have the Biblio ads authorities set to don't allow in 2205, when you are upgraded to 2211, require choosing existing authority will be set to require and auto link Biblios will be set to don't. And the reverse of that is true. If you have Biblio ads authorities set to allow in 2205, then require choosing existing authority will be set to don't require and auto link Biblios will be set to do. Um, so just so you know how those are coming over at the upgrade, I do have a blog post that I'm testing and I will get that up as soon as possible with a little bit more detail on those behaviors in this release. So that's exciting, a little bit more control over authorities um, in 2211. Katrina, Katrina. Um, quick question. And this is probably, I know you already have it in your blog post. I don't know if you, or if you have the information right in front of you though. Um, what will happen when records are loaded as a batch for those authorities? How will these come into play? Um, so the auto linked authorities is going to check um, if you have this set to do, then when you import those authorities, it will check the headings when they're coming in. Um, if you have require choosing existing authorities set to require when you're um, bringing in new records, if it does not find um, an authority that exists, then it will just um, come, in, the record will still come in with um, those subject headings, but it won't, unless you have the auto link biblio set to do, they will not be linked to your authority records. Um, can you define which fields require authorities or is it set for all? Um, 
it depends on your system preferences that you have set. Um, so if you have required choosing existing authorities set to require, that will be on all fields. That's um, not set field by field. Um, if you have that set to don't require, then you have a little bit more flexible um, flexibility in defining that. But um, that's one that I, I have to get back to with the more detail. Um, authorities is not my area of expertise. I've just been diving into some of these system preferences, um, but we can get back to you. Um, what other questions have I missed in the chat, Donna? You're good, that's all of them. Okay, all right. All right, so next up, I get to show you all a really cool enhancement that was sponsored by Monterey Free Libraries and the Click Colorado Library Consortium. And this is the ability to um, set an item template. So um, some really great potential with this one. So in the past, if we wanted to make sure when we were adding a record, we'd have to adjust the framework and that brought all sorts of complications in there. So now we have the ability to create item templates. So for instance, this is how I'm imagining seeing these sorts of things. We have an omnibus bib record for all of our ILL items. When I come in here and have a new ILL item that I need to add to this record so I can circulate it, I can come in and do my new item. And then you'll notice at the top, I have the ability to choose some templates. So I have my templates, which I'm the only one that can see those, or you have templates that you can share with the entire system. Now kind of think about that though, if you are a large system, how many templates do you really want on this list? So you're gonna to wanna to kind of think that through with your workflows as far as how many templates you want in your system, but everyone can have their own templates. So I can come in here and say, okay, this is an ILL item. I'm gonna grab my ILL template, apply that template, Again, I have the ability that I can do four sessions. So if I have 15, 20 ILL items that I'm adding, I can just keep that one going as I, as I go through this one. And you will see it went ahead and populated anything that I've put in here. So I've got my material specified note. I have my prompt, put the title and the call number. Um, it went ahead and filled in my barcode. That's just our settings on our system. I've got my replacement set replacement price set in here. I've got my non-public note in here and my item type, all of those sorts of things. So I can go ahead and just very quickly go through and get those items added in here. And so we're going to say something. I'm going to go ahead and add my item that's in there, ready to go. So when I look at my holding statement, all of that stuff is in there. So I can go ahead and do another new item. If I want to create a template, I can come in here and say, okay, this is going to be blah, blah, blah. And it is going to have a not for loan status of in-house only. I can set my collection code. I can set my shelving locations. I can set all of that information. And then I can go ahead and save it as a template. This is permissions based as to whether or not you can um, share templates, control, you know, delete other people's templates, those sorts of things. But I'm going to go ahead and say this is going to be called, you know, stuff. And I hit save. Okay, so now that template is going to be there available for me to use as we go through this. So kind of exciting. Um, definitely going to save some workflows as we're going through stuff. Um, so really like that, um, that functionality to be able to see this one. Um, yeah, uh, Michael, I know a lot of libraries have kind of been doing some hacking. Um, so this is definitely going to make things a whole lot better. Um, we will have a more in-depth blog post coming on this also um, with some suggestions. The big question that we've been getting is how can I share this with a couple of people without sharing it with everyone? So we've got a workflow that we're going to suggest um, that may help with that um, kind of middle ground. So watch for that to be coming fairly soon. So yeah, that's an, that's an exciting one. Um, the next one is, I think, almost as exciting. Um, we've had a lot of libraries asking for this sort of functionality. This was sponsored by the Arlington Public Library, and this gives you the ability to group items for records and to place group level holds. So depending on what your scenarios, you know your, your content, but for instance, my library has the Whiskey Advocate, periodical, as a patron, I want to be able to see, I want a copy of the winter 2022. But as a patron, I don't know which copy is gonna be back. And I don't wanna place just a bib level hold because that's not gonna be helpful either. So this gives you that middle ground. You can see here that we have a column called item group. 
And this lets you go ahead and put things together into groups. So I have a spring 2023 group for the spring 2023 issue, and then a winter 2022 group for the winter 2022. These are created in your item groups. So we're gonna go through the process. I have summer 23 has just arrived. I need to add that into my item groups. So I'm gonna click on the item groups tab. I'm gonna do a new item group. I'm gonna call it whatever it is. So this is summer 2023. That has now been created. So now I can come into my holdings. I can say, show me all those summer ones. I'm gonna select all of those at once. And you'll see I have some new links up here. I'm going to add move to an item group, choose my item group, set it. And now all of those are in that same item group. So very easy to kind of group things together. So this is going to be really helpful for those sorts of things. The really cool part, though, is when you come and look at holds, I've set up a couple of holds here. We can see that we have the traditional bib level hold, which with a magazine like this is, is pretty much useless because it's going to be, you know, luck of the draw, which one gets pulled off the shelf. I have an item level hold, which means only this copy is going to work for me. And who knows when that one's going to be available. Or I have the next available item from that group. So the next available copy of spring 2023 is going to come to me in that hold. So when I place a hold, I have an option now, bib level hold, item level hold, group hold. So I'm gonna say, I want the summer 2023, place that hold. And now that hold has been added for the next available item from that one. So really great functionality to be able to kind of get that middle ground um, as far as being able to place holds without having to choose a specific copy and hoping that's the one that comes back next. Um, we have libraries I know that circulate uh, DVD series or TV series that are broken up. So I've got, you know, on my record, I have four copies of disc one and four copies of disc two and four copies of disc three. Again, that same sort of scenario, I can go ahead and say, you know what, I just want the next copy of disc two that's available and that will be um, set for me. So yay, I love this one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Y'all know I don't get that excited about cataloging stuff, so but this is really cool. It's a great functionality as we go through that one. Um, this last one I want to talk about is bundles. So we know that, you know, a couple years ago, bundles got really popular. Um, patrons couldn't come in and browse anymore, so libraries were putting together kind of bundles of here's 12 books on trucks, um, you know, or here's 15 Amish romances or whatever it was doing. Um, and there wasn't a great way to handle that. Um, so now we do have the functionality um, that lets you create bundles of items for circulation. And so this is really a neat thing. And again, we're going to have a, a more in-depth blog post on this one to kind of emphasize how this works. But you can see here that I have a bib record for this bundle that I've created. Um, the key thing to remember in this one is in the leader, when you are creating your record, you need to set position seven to C. Now, you think I know that that's how that works, but I just, that's just, yeah. That's just what you do. Um, so you need to set the position seven in the zero, zero, zero to C in order to, in, on the bib record, in order for this to work. Okay, so that's the first thing you're going to do. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to create a new holding. So an individual item with one barcode that this is what is gets circulated. So we have the one item here that is called barcode of bundle one. And then on the far right of my screen, we'll see that you have a new button here called Manage Bundle. So if I go ahead and click on that Manage Bundle, we're going to see down here the items that I have brought into this bundle. So Bundle 1 is going to circulate these three particular items. Okay, so I grabbed a couple of, of puppy books that are going to be my bundle. I've added them to my bundle by clicking on Add to Bundle and then entering the barcode. So I can go ahead and just scan the barcodes as I'm going through this. Seven, three, three. Okay, that item has now been added to my bundle. And so we'll see those all down here. Okay, I can also remove from the bundle fairly quickly just by scanning, or I can come over on the right hand side here 
and I can go ahead and remove item, individual items from the bundles this way too. But those four items now are part of this bundle. If you look at that record in the system for something that's part of a bundle, you will see the statement that this is not for loan, it is part of a bundle, so it cannot circulate on by itself. It has to circulate as part of that bundle. Okay. So we've got our bundles, which is really a neat idea. We're gonna come over to circulation and we are going to check out, let me grab my last patron that we had up here. And she is checking out bundle one. Okay, yeah, we're gonna check that out to her. And there we go, we can see in our note here, this is the title, this is a bundle. There's a bundle of four items and this is when it's due back. So when we look at the patron's record, we will just see that information. Um, so it's basically one circ that we're looking at, but it's one checkout for them, but it has all of those items in there. Now, they return the, they return the bundle. I come to my check-in screen. I go ahead and scan the barcode for bundle one. And it says, okay, here's what's supposed to be in here. So at this point, you're gonna have your staff go ahead and scan each of those items, each of those barcodes. It says, okay, all of those have been verified. I'm gonna go ahead and confirm my check-in. Anything that was missing would have been marked lost. And I also have the ability to go ahead and say everything that I did just as kind of a double check. So there's your bundles. Um, the circulation shows at the bundle level, not at the individual item level. Um, so if you do want to track the individual circ, let us know and we'll work with you on finding a way to be able to say, okay, this particular item was in this bundle and circulated this way, but it does track it as a bundle, not the individual barcodes that are part of that bundle. We all think pretty exciting, right? Sorry. Up on the um, group holds, hold groups. We had a question about how do they appear on the holds queue? Um, I, we don't have the holds queue currently running in our site, but on the holds to pull, you can show them what that looks like. Okay, so it's gonna tell you this available barcode or any item from that particular bundle, or excuse me, from that particular um, item group. So Q is probably something very similar to that. We just it don't does. Have it shows the same thing. Yeah. So yeah. So now start thinking about your bundles again. I know lots of libraries are doing library of things. Um, great way to kind of keep those all coordinated together as you're going. Um, some fun stuff for that one. Um, if you forgot to scan one of the returned items, can you change its status from lost return? You can just check that individual item in. And it will go ahead and clear that lost status and it will keep it as part of the bundle so it doesn't remove it from the bundle um, but you can go ahead and just uh, check that item in and it'll go ahead and update that um, just like it would with anything else so yeah okay i'm looking forward to seeing how y'all are using these uh, the bundles and the item groups especially the bundles i think that's going to be really fun but i also want to see what y'all come up with for the item groups so ways to make your life easier for you and your patrons so looking forward to that one. Um, Katrina, I think I'm tossing it back to you, right? Yes, you are. Um, so I am going to show a couple of things that are new in the acquisitions module. So within acquisitions, um, I want to show you one of my vendors, it's Sunshine Books. Um, we now have the ability, so it used to be that our late orders were populated by uh, whatever you had set within the delivery time by vendor. So if your delivery time was 21 days set at the vendor level, every basket that you had uh, would default to that 21 days from whenever you had closed that basket. Uh, now you have the ability in 2211 to edit that by line for open and closed orders. So you'll see that this is an open order. So I can go into this basket 
And I can edit right here from the line to say, um, you'll see this item I've said is actually rather than the 21 days that I expect for most orders from this vendor, this title I know is not going to be published until November, but I'm getting my early order in now, my pre-order. So I can save that by line and I'm able to edit that. So for that particular line, this one where I have not indicated a date is going to use the default populated by at the vendor level. And I have that ability then to customize that for closed or open orders. So you'll see this is a closed order. I can go in here and edit the estimated delivery date um, by line there as well. Um, so now when I go over to late orders, I can also edit it here. So maybe uh, this one uh, that was expected back in 2021, I say, actually, I've talked to them since then. And the new anticipated delivery date is going to be, you know, 2024. They pushed the publication on that one a bunch. And so now I'll have an update on that so I can update that line from the order, from an open order, from a closed order, or from this late orders table uh, within acquisitions, which is pretty awesome. Uh, the next enhancement we're gonna see uh, within acquisitions is also um, on the invoice uh, level. So here's my Sunshine Books. If I go to invoices rather than baskets, I'll see that I've got a couple of invoices for that right now. And I'm gonna show you um, back on my acquisitions homepage. Here's for these uh, funds that I've got right now. I've got a couple. I've got my romance and Western. So I wanna take a look at those lines in particular. Um, so I can say for this particular invoice, I have one item in it and it's coming from my Western books fund. Um, so if I modify that invoice, I can say, actually, those items need to be applied against my romance books fund. And when I select update, my order has been updated. And so when I come over here and refresh my budgets, I'll see that it just moved it right out of the money spent against my Western's budget and moved it into my romance budget. And so I can uh, do that for any of my invoices. Um, oops. For Sunshine Books, if I go back into my invoices, I can see that I will have the ability to modify the fund on those invoices. So it's a small thing, but it gives you a little more flexibility when controlling um, your budgeting capabilities within the acquisitions module. A couple of questions for you, Katrina. Mm -hmm. um, if that field is not filled in, does the late order report not run? And what is the default if the field is not populated? So that's going to run off of, um, if the field is not filled in, it's going to pull in whatever you have set as the default in your vendor. And if your vendor doesn't have a date set in the default for at the vendor level, it won't populate. Um, and then will that update the fund in the cart level as well? Um, I'm not sure I... Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to put that all the way across. It's going to change that order also for that one so yeah oh, yes within the order yeah excellent some exciting things i know that that last one is being able to change the, the fund particularly after receipt um was a big one because before we'd have to unreceive it and we yeah. It. yeah lots <laughs> yeah. of extra steps have waited in the workaround on that yeah Excellent. We have five minutes, Donna. I know what our favorite features are. We kind of talked about them as we went through. Like, I love the new tools in the cataloging module and the configure button, the wrench that you now have if you have permissions on tables, I think are my two favorite things in this release. But I would love to hear what everybody else is excited about. Oh, goodness. Um, I, I really, I love the bundles, um, because we've, it's one of those things that, again, we come up with so many workarounds for with our partners to try and do that one. Um, and then I really do love the guarantor guarantee, um, changes because I have worked with so many libraries where it's, yes, they have child type accounts for law firm partners and whatever else, but I also love the ability. Now we've asked a lot, you know, with a lot of, um, 
families where they have responsibilities for other adults of guardianships um, that there's you know there's no differentiation in those accounts now so we can link those all together so i do like that ability of being able to group those um, what about anybody else i'm very excited for the way the ability to refund lost item fees without creating credits because i know a number of libraries haven't turned that feature on because they don't want to deal with credits and so they'll be able to use you know tighten up their workflows a little bit so they don't have to rely on their staff to go in and write off those fees every time we have a question is there a way to see how the public will see a bundle title in the opac so let me show you what that is so this is one of the items within the bundle um, and we can see here that this is um bundle checkoutable um that's i that's a really bad name it's just what we were using for a marker so you would have a better status than that one um but it tells you that that one isn't a bundle basically not available um but for the bundle itself you'll see just the title um and whatever is in there as far as your holdings so this is where you're going to want to be a much better cataloger than i am and kind of put in there what those um bundles are using you know your call number whatever um descriptions so that you can see what those bundles are a part of so yeah that's what it's going to go ahead and, and take a look at um in the opac Um, everyone here is equally excited and terrified about item groups. Yes, um, it's really exciting, um, but it is, we will be honest, it is going to be manual work setting that up. And so one of the things that we're, that we're suggesting is if you have the ability to do it, start fresh. Um, you know, say, okay, you know what, as of um, July 1st, we're going to start using um, item groups. Um, and kind of just move forward from there if you can, because it, otherwise it is going to be a manual process of going in and setting up all the old ones, um, those sorts of things. So definitely kind of think about workflows. And again, we are always happy to kind of walk through ideas with those. Um, one of the Monday Minutes mentioned new pages. Yes, um, that is really exciting. That gives you the ability to add random web pages, which I know sounds really weird, um, but it gives you the ability to add pages of information um, for your partners. We have a great Monday Minutes on that one, and I'm really excited again to see how partners are going to be using that um, and what creative things they come up with. This morning, they want to build kind of some lib guides basically into their site, so they'll be able to do that with the CRM, that new, that new feature. Um, and then uh, last question, when creating the bundle, can you create your own bundle name? Absolutely. Um, I just was being flippant and created the bib record called this is a bundle um, so we could find it. Um, we are using our test site, which we do all sorts of weird things to. Um, so we always kind of just go with like the straightforward, this is a bundle bib record. But yeah, you would create the bib record for whatever you want that to be. Um, so for instance, if you were going to be doing ones for, you know, easy readers, whatever, you could create a bib record where the title of the of that bib record is um, kitty books for easy readers. Um, and then you could have, you know, multiple bundles attached to that bib record um, where you could have five or six different sets of books about kitties that are being um, circulated as a bundle. So yeah, you can do it however you want to. You're basically setting up a bib record um, as the, the top level, and then you attach your individual circulating groups of items to that one. Um, if someone were to be looking at a bundle member it, it basically shows that that item that that item is not available because it is part of a bundle. So yeah, your patrons will see that it, you can't check it out individually. It is part of a bundle, but it does link them to what that bundle is so they could see that one. Um, does every item in the bundle need its own bib record? Um, no, it does have to be an item record though. So you do have to have it attached somewhere. Um, but I had one library um, play with the idea of, I'm gonna create a bib record that is just called bundle items. And they're going to throw each individual item on there and just pull them from there. So again, it's kind of what makes sense for you and how you want to work that through. But again, we're more than happy to kind of talk through those processes. Um, back to the ILL list of titles we don't have. Is there a way to make the list display alphabetically by titles? Yes, you can search on or you can sort on some of those different holdings um, in that holdings table. Um, so for instance, in the ILL one that I was using, let me share my screen again real quick. Okay. 
Um, so in this one that I was working on, um, since I have it um, sorted, uh, I have my titles in the call number, I can sort on that call number column to go ahead and sort it alphabetically. Be far more impressive if I actually had more than one thing in there, um, but you can sort on any of these where you do see the arrows. Now, one of the other things that you can do in here is that some of these tables, you have the ability to decide what is the default sort what column is it sorting for by default but be aware it would be for everything um, so it's not just this particular bib record if i said i want all of my bib records holding tables to be sorted by call number every single bib record will have their holdings table sorted by call number and that's not necessarily ideal um, so a lot of times we say just go ahead and do that one click to go ahead and sort those items by whatever column it is that you want to sort those on so it's not going to be automatically um, but you will, it is just one click to go ahead and make that sort the way that Donna, you I know we are at the top of the hours. Um, we have some questions here um, in the Q&A and in the chat. So we are going to hold those and we'll make sure that those questions are addressed in the follow-up blog posts. Absolutely. So y'all, thank you for this wild ride and for joining us along. Um, like I said, we have those blog posts are going to be coming out and we hope that you find as much enjoyment in 2211 as we have had. So y'all have an awesome day. Bye, everybody.